I'm very pleased to welcome you all here to Double S today. Uh, my name is Matthew Harries. I'm Managing Editor of Survival, the Institute's journal, um, and a Research Fellow here at the Institute for Transatlantic Affairs. Uh, I'm very pleased to welcome an old friend, Ben Buchanan, um, who's currently a postdoctoral fellow at the Belfer Center at Harvard, um, but before that was a scholar at the Wilson Center, and before that um, received his PhD in the War Studies Department at King's, where he was a Marshall Scholar. Uh, he's talking today about the cybersecurity dilemma, which is also the title of his forthcoming book, uh, which will be published uh, early next year with Hearst. Um, he is also the, uh, the author of two survival articles, the most recent of which um, is called The Life Cycles of Cyber Threats, which is a very good read. Um, and uh, we are holding this meeting as one of a recurring series of survival seminars where we invite survival authors in um, to talk about their research. Uh, we're going to approach this slightly differently from normal in that um, we'll ask, I'll ask some questions of Ben and have him respond a few times, um, and then we'll open it up to the floor rather than it just being a straight um, talk and, and question and answer. So with that, I guess the first question, the necessary preliminary question is, the cybersecurity dilemma refers to uh, the IR concept of the security dilemma. So for those people who haven't had the misfortune of sitting through uh, IR classes, um, what is the security dilemma and what's the point of this? Thanks very much for having me and thank you all for coming. The security dilemma, um, for those of you who want to brush up on your IR, um, it's always assigned, not always read. Uh, is the notion that as a nation defends itself, as all nations must do, uh, it sometimes inadvertently causes other nations fear. So this goes back to the, the Greek, sometimes the security dilemma is called the Thucydides trap, because he said that as Athens rose, it made Lacedaemon know that there was such fear and war was inevitable. So it takes place at a strategic level as well, where a, nation, a rising nation fears a nation already uh, in power but also takes place at an operational level. Uh, my favorite example of this story is uh, October 28, 1962, the height of the Cuban Missile Crisis, where as the leaders were battling out over Cuba, the United States had a routine air sampling mission with a U-2 over the North Pole. Nothing to do with the crisis, just an ordinary operation um, to see if the Russians had conducted a nuclear test. And the pilot was blinded by the Northern Lights and made a wrong turn over the Soviet Union. The Soviets thought it was a nuclear attack, they sent out the fires to shoot down the pilot. The American radioed back to Alaska and said, I'm in trouble. Send whatever you've got. The only thing the Americans had in Alaska was two uh, airplanes armed with air-to-air -air nuclear weapons. So they sent those. And suddenly, at an operational level, we had a nuclear crisis playing out over the Soviet Union. Uh, someone told McNamara this, and he turned white as a sheet and said, this means war with the Soviet Union. Uh, what he didn't say was, we didn't even want this war, but we might have it anyway. Uh, an operational security dilemma crisis can lead to conflict that no one wants. Okay, um, I should say uh, that there is a recording device here, uh, and we are on the record. Well, uh, I take back that answer, then. Uh, yes. <laughs> um, right, so that's the security dilemma. So the idea is that states do things in their own defense that encourages others to feel threatened. So in the cyber realm... Uh, what kind of capabilities are we talking about? Uh, you know, in um, maybe breaking it down first, what kind of offensive capabilities uh, can one state develop that will cause another to feel threatened in this way? One of the things that's striking about offensive capabilities in cyber is that it requires gaining access to the target system in advance of actually launching the attack. So uh, if you're building an airplane, if you're building a fighter plane, it works the same way in the Atlantic as in the Pacific. That's not the case with a cyber capability. Cyber capability, if you're targeting Russia, is different than if you're targeting China. And it requires gaining access and making an intrusion into the adversary systems to do reconnaissance, often over a period of months, to figure out how you're going to cause harm. So if you're talking about offensive capabilities, if you're talking about doing damage, um, know that it requires this long lead time of access. In other words, before the conflict starts, you want the option to attack, you need to, to break in. And this can create a security dilemma of itself. If you want to create deterrence, um, have no intention of actually striking, you just want to have a deterrent, you need to break in. And if the other side discovers that break in, 
there's a possibility that they could think an attack is coming and they could fear it and they could misinterpret your desire for deterrence as uh, an impending attack and that can lead to escalation. <clears throat> so it's due to the offensive operational nature of cybersecurity. Okay, so that's the offensive side. In a, in a sense, if that was all, then perhaps it would be easier to mitigate, but having uh, read your work before, I understand that part of your argument is that this also applies on the defensive side. So it's the state measures that states take to protect themselves from cyber intrusions also contribute to this dilemma. That's right. So you could stop the argument right where I mentioned it in the last answer. You could say, well, some states want to do deterrence, the sort of defensive, quasi-defensive notion. Um, in setting up the deterrence options, they risk um, threatening other states unintentionally. But you can actually go substantially further. And um, what I try to do is show that there are good defensive reasons to intrude into other states' networks, to break in. So think about um, just defense in general, putting aside cybersecurity for a second. When you check into a building like this, we have a perimeter-based defense. You all show an ID. And there are rough equivalents in cybersecurity as well. Um, if survival and IIISS wants to up their security, they could do what's called hunting. They could have a guard walk around the building inside the perimeter and identify suspicious people and ask for IDs. And we have an equivalent in cybersecurity as well. And that's often where um, organizations stop on the defensive side, both in physical space and in cybersecurity. But if you're a nation and you collect intelligence and you can do these kind of things, there's the option to break into your adversary's network, steal the information about how it is they're going to attack, and use that to inform your defenses before the attack comes. And this notion uh, is alluded to by President Obama, uh, by NSA officials, when they justify a lot of the collection and intrusions that the intelligence agencies carry out. They allude to it in a very strategic sense. Um, a lot of you might know the uh, know of the contractor Edward Snowden from the NSA who leaked operational slides. I brought a couple of the slides here today, which we can just quickly look at. And these actually illustrate the idea uh, in practice. So this is a classified NSA slide. I did not make this, so I forgive, forgive the clip art graphics. Um, and this is a secret NSA program called Tutelage. Uh, this has almost never been reported on in the press, uh, but it is in a uh, slide deck leak by Mr. Snowden. And it's sort of hard to see the blue and the, and the red here, but the blue is uh, NSA's conception of itself. And before the intrusion, uh, they say, well, we're going to discover the adversary's tools and tradecraft. We're going to break in, and uh, we're going to figure out what it is they're developing. We're going to develop a countermeasure. We're going to deploy it. We're going to recognize their intentions who they're going to go after, and then when the attack comes, we're going to have a sing singles intelligence naval defense. Essentially saying, if we can play pseudo-offense first, we break in, we can get better at defense. And then we have all the different things you can do. Once you get this position of power, you can block the attack, you can make it seem like it succeeds even when it doesn't, you can <coughs> redirect it, you can study it, you can make it go really slowly so they think the code is broken and they try to fix it but they can't figure out what's wrong. A lot of possibilities once you get this position of privilege. And I'll just show one, one or two more here. This is a case called Arrow Eclipse. Uh, I should say, I don't make these code names, so uh, I don't know how they come up with that. Uh, this is a case of uh, NSA Threat Operations Center. That's the NTOC you see there. Uh, it's a defensive part of NSA, recognizing a threat from Chinese hackers and tasking the offensive part of NSA, TAO, Tailored Access Operations, to go and break into Chinese networks and gather information that is useful for defense. And then the next slide shows all the, the things that TAO was able to get. So they were able to get the def defense contractors that were the targets, the US government entities the Chinese wanted to break into, um, the bios of the officials the Chinese were targeting, and then the key stuff is down here, the source code, the actual tools the Chinese were using. And when you get these tools, these what are called exploits, if you know what's coming, it's much easier to block it. And there's a lot of examples in the slides of these kinds of intrusions for truly defensive purposes, um, enabling uh, the United States to get better at defense against advanced threats. And the obvious implication is, if you're intruding for defense and you're intruding for offense, it's very hard to tell them apart sometimes. And that can lead to a security dilemma, a cybersecurity dilemma, 
in and of itself. So <clears throat> let's push a bit further on that point. So the, at the core of the security dilemma in general is the idea that one state fears what might come next out of a sense of uncertainty. So what, what does that kind of intrusion for defensive purposes look like to the other side? Right. So um, traditional security dilemma logic will tell you that if you can't tell offense from defense, if you can't differentiate them, you're more likely to have a security dilemma because um, you're going to assume the worst as a decision maker. Uh, and there are some harms that can come from any network intrusion, any hacking incident. The most obvious harm is that it actually is a no kidding, sophisticated cyber attack. So we saw last year in Ukraine the first, or first publicly reported cyber attack that caused a blackout. Uh, almost certainly Russian hackers were in Ukrainian systems for months in this power facility. They understood how it worked and how, how, it, caused harm, how it caused harm to it. So one thing a state might fear is the intrusion that actually is defensive is gathering intelligence for a sophisticated attack. Another thing it might fear is the intrusion actually is defensive, truly is defensive. But in a crisis, that access could be repurposed to have a less sophisticated but still powerful attack. So the kind of attack we see against Sony requires very little intelligence collection. When North Korea attacked Sony, it just wiped a lot of computers. You could do that with the access gained from a defensive intrusion. And then there's additional harms that states fear about espionage, the loss of strategic secrets, um, sort of run-of-the-mill stuff that uh, is significant and is also enabled by intrusions. So these are the fears that come to mind. These are the threats that are often unintentional, even when a nation launches a defensive intrusion. And the difficulty in telling uh, defensive from offensive and the flexibility in switching a genuinely defensive intrusion to an offensive one is what makes the cybersecurity dilemma acute. So uh, are there any, so what does this mean then for <coughs> states that are interested in mitigating the, the cybersecurity dilemma or not getting sucked into this um, hacking? Is the implication that there's an interest in restraint? Um, you know, in other areas, you might be thinking about arms control solutions or confidence building measures. You know, what are the options? What can you do about this? Every security dilemma um, can be mitigated in its own way. The question is at what cost? So I think uh, the reason the cybersecurity dilemma is particularly challenging is the traditional mechanisms of signaling and international relations don't work terribly well. Um, for example, in traditional IR theory, as I said, you would make a, a show of your defensive capabilities to indicate to the other side that um, they didn't have things to fear. But in cybersecurity, these kinds of defensive intrusions very quickly can turn to offensive. Uh, and traditional ideas like arms control, which have been successful in the past, don't work as well in cybersecurity because of challenges of verification. And I'll, I'll give one example here. Um, in the 80s, or in the 70s and 80s, um, the United States and Soviet Union signed and then implemented the SALT II uh, treaty on nuclear weapons. And one of the verification mechanisms they put in place was the telemetry of the nuclear weapons, the telemetry of the missiles, had to be unencrypted so that the other side could intercept it uh, and understand what the weapons capabilities were. And this was how each side knew that the other counterpart was not cheating on the agreement. In cybersecurity, the, that's a non-starter. The United States and the United Kingdom will never allow all of the government computers to be unencrypted so that China or Russia could verify we're not developing a cyber weapon that's outside of some bounds. So the fact that you could walk in with a cyber weapon, broadly speaking, on a USB drive makes verification much harder. So I'm less optimistic that um, we're going to manage a cybersecurity dilemma uh, too well anytime soon. I think we're just going to be along for the ride and, and hope that policymakers can talk to one another directly and reassure each other that they don't mean, they don't mean harm. And one of the concepts that's talked about a lot in the cybersecurity context is the difficulty of attribution, of, of working out who it is that's responsible for um, an intrusion or an attack. How does that play into the, the cybersecurity dilemma? Right, so attribution is a subject of, of great interest to me. And it plays in in two ways. Um, on one hand, you could have 
an objection to cybersecurity dilemma, which says, you know, Ben, I think nations don't know who's hacked them. It's impossible for them to determine it. And therefore, you don't have a cybersecurity dilemma because they don't know who to fear. They suffer an intrusion. They don't know who it is. There's no escalation. And my response is, at the tip of the spear, we're talking sophisticated intelligence agencies, attribution is far more possible than people think. And there's a variety of ways in which that's done. One of them is exactly these kinds of defensive intrusions. So the New York Times has reported that one of the ways the United States knew that it was North Korea who hacked Sony was the United States was in North Korean networks and watching the activity. And I find this perfectly uh, likely, more than even more than plausible. So one of the reasons to have defensive intrusions is to enhance attribution. Another wrinkle is that when you have this kind of access to United States malicious code, when you have access to their exploits, their capabilities, that creates the possibility of repurposing those exploits and using them for your own gains and possibly in a false flag operation. And that, of course, is quite concerning. If uh, a state that suffers an intrusion risks its exploits being taken and used by someone else as a uh, way to potentially start a conflict, that's quite a risk as well. So attribution both uh, makes defensive intrusions more likely and more powerful, but also raises the threat that states feel feel from those kind of intrusions. Okay, thanks. Um, I think it's a really good starting point um, to outline the concept. Let's open it up to um, questions and comments now. I would just ask that you um, uh, introduce yourself uh, uh, before asking your question. Yes, sir. My name is Mahmoud Ali. Um, very ancient student of war studies from Queens many, many years ago. Um, first question is um, Stuxnet. What can you tell us about it? Who did it? Why did it? Was it effective? Are there any countermeasures now possible for any country to save itself from a uh, system such as that? And secondly, uh, was Snowden absolutely accurate in everything that he revealed? Because if he did, then we are all doing it, all of us, against everybody else. So who is the good guy, who is the bad guy in this? Is there a sort of normative framework to say, this is right, that is unacceptable? Uh, last year, when Xi Jinping was in Washington, they did sign some sort of an agreement. Uh, and based to an extent on that, G20 then issued a cybersecurity framework as well. Has that worked? Uh, do we know? How do we know? Thank you. OK, well, let's take a couple together. I'm writing questions down. Sounds great. In case your memory is as bad as mine. Uh, yes. Hi there, I'm Jonathan from the Home Office. How does what you're describing in terms of offensive um, intrusion and defense intrusion differ from traditional espionage? Okay. Do you want to pick these? Yeah. All right, so let's start with Stuxnet. So Stuxnet is uh, almost certainly a US-Israeli attack on the Iranian nuclear program. <coughs> we don't need to parse too many of the details of it now. I would just note that it exhibits the traits I described of offensive operations. So Stuxnet is an attack that was preceded by an enormous uh, amount of reconnaissance. Indeed, there was a separate piece of malicious code uh, called FANI, once again, I don't name these things, that um, enable the Stuxnet attack. So it's quite fair to say that uh, perhaps in 2007, 2008, when this program began, the Iranians wouldn't have been surprised that the United States was spying on that nuclear program. I think if they discovered a similar intrusion today, they'd be more fearful because they know of the linkage between espionage and attack. And this actually uh, relates to the second question here. I'll come back to your others. In that one of the ways this dynamic I'm describing is different from traditional espionage is we have a much tighter linkage between exploitation, gathering information, and attack. Uh, it's much easier to convert a reconnaissance operation into an attack operation than it is perhaps in the physical domain. An implant on a cyber system can become an attack weapon more easily than a single spy in a foreign country can become a brigade. So it's this tight linkage. It's the, the uh, small window given to states to respond uh, when a counterparty decides they want to attack that makes any intrusion, even an espionage intrusion, uh, as threatening. So let's circle back here. So you asked about uh, Snowden, and you asked about norms. So on the Snowden front, uh, I'm not in the business of judging who's right and who's wrong. Uh, I'm just in the business of trying to understand what's out there. Um, these Snowden slides here are 
part of a, a large dump to Der Spiegel that um, got very little media attention. So I was just going through the slides and trying to unpack how operations take place. Um, I can tell you that the reason Snowden leaks slides like this, which don't deal with privacy and civil liberties, I think is that Snowden has a concern, uh, rightly or wrongly, I'm not positioned to judge, about the militarization of cyberspace and the militarization of the internet. I don't think Snowden, who's fundamentally a geek, puts it in terms of the security dilemma, but I think his view is that we have this great thing of the internet and it shouldn't be uh, under the dominion of states. He often warns about programs that automatically shoot back against cyber attacks. And on the norms point, um, you're right, the US and China signed an agreement that was then picked up by the G20. That agreement relates to economic espionage. So gathering information for the purposes of benefiting specific corporations in your country. So that, uh, a good first step, but we're a long way from mitigating the cybersecurity limit challenges, which relate to <coughs> political espionage, military espionage, and ultimately attack. Uh, so my, my, my statement question come, uh, is related to strategic deterrence. And, uh, and you mentioned already that there is uh, very little difference between, or difficulty to distinguish between defensive uh, intrusion and then attack. Uh, I wonder if there's any clear distinguishing lines or whether it's a merge between a, a minor attack, attacks we experience every day, and, a, and, a, and at the top end, a strategic attack that takes down uh, systems that are essential to uh, everyday living, and whether that's just a graded system. And, and in which case, I wanted you to comment on whether there's a possibility that uh, cyber, uh, offensive cyber capabilities may evolve into a strategic deterrent capability. Uh, and therefore, uh, that, could, that could not only undermine existing strategic nuclear capabilities, uh, or at least the confidence that, that they could fire, um, but, it, but equally, uh, is there a possibility that these could substitute and that states eventually choose to rely upon um, cyber strategic deterrence rather than uh, physical systems. Okay, let's take the lady in the front as well. Uh, Dr. Christina Meyer, which is a World Peace Organization. I see that uh, humanity spent a lot of money and use a very high coefficient of intelligence to prepare humanity to new strategy of conflict. And it is a waste of time, because when we have a huge conflict, nobody can escape. We are all prisoners of our earth. So it wouldn't be better to create one international organization which can give a peace guarantee for entire world to seize, you know, and keep it under the control, but not suspect you do with that. Uh, and uh, uh, my vision is to create an international organization of military leaders to guarantee world peace, where target is prevention of conflict, prevention of war and space research, because finally we should go space research as well, because we are probably not only one humanity in our galaxy. So that's uh, instead to concentrate to kill each other on our Earth, outside, okay, and um, protect. And take one more hand right the back, please. Um, Thank you for the King's War Studies. Um, I'd just like to ask you about uh, that another famous work in this area, you know that a cyber war will not take place by your former supervisor, I assume. Um, <laughs> We've met, yeah. yeah. <laughs> How does, to what extent does your argument is consistent with that? To what extent is it uh, rather different than mine? Well, he passed me, so he's not against it, I don't think. <laughs> um, or, he was, or he wanted to be rid of me. So let's actually take the, the first and the third together about this notion of attack and then strategic attack, some might call it cyber war. Um, I think the cybersecurity dilemma, let's be clear, is bounded to networks uh, that are of great strategic importance to a state. So you mentioned nuclear command and control. That would certainly qualify. If you found an intrusion into a nuclear command and control network and you risked the possibility that you wouldn't have a deterrent, a nuclear deterrent when you wanted it, that would be treated incredibly seriously, whether it was defensive or offensive. So um, the minor attacks that you described, I think, probably don't fall in the boundary of any security dilemma. The security dilemma comes into play when we are in very critical networks, things that, that can be um, 
truly considered threatening. Now, there's a question you asked, and then also about cyber war, of at what point can this replace a nuclear deterrent? I don't think it ever can. Um, the way I look at it is that nuclear weapons are strategic weapons wielded by policymakers, uh, often in a matter of minutes. Cyber weapons are operational weapons wielded by line officers following broad principles of policymakers. In the right circumstance, in the right capability, they can be very threatening and very effective. But the cyber nuclear analogy has very clear limits, and there's um, no substitute for nuclear weapons right now. There's a question, though, of can this be cyber war? Uh, I think 20 years from now, we're not going to talk about the cybersecurity dilemma or cyber war. We're going to talk about the security dilemma and war, and the cyber component will be baked into both of them. Uh, the example I'll give here that uh, is the best rebuttal to Thomas Ridd's book, Cyber War Won't Take Place, which is a terrific book, uh, and I am no longer a student, so I don't have to say that, uh, <laughs> is an attack, or a, a planned attack, a contingency plan called Nitro Zeus, which, uh, according to reports, was the contingency plan to follow up to Stuxnet. And if there was a war between Iran and the United States, or Iran and Israel, in which the United States president wanted options short of full-on kinetic attack to cripple key parts of Iranian society, the United States, according to the New York Times and others, spent hundreds of millions of dollars breaking into U.S. systems, preparing attacks against key parts of Iranian infrastructure, and never used it. So this is an example, if these reports are true, of establishing the kind of deterrent I mentioned before. You break in, you gain access, prepare the capability, and you wait until it's required. Uh, I don't know if that's Clausewitzian war in the Thomas Ridd sense of the word. Um, I do think it's significant enough to be a threat for state suffering and intrusion. And then lastly, the second question, uh, I, I think I'm right there with you that I'd love to see more cooperation between nations. Um, the problem the security dilemma folks talk about in some call it a need of tragedy is that each nation ultimately stands on its own and responsible for its own security. So when you ask nations to cooperate, to some degree you're asking them to take a risk. And when they suffer an intrusion, when they see another side build tanks, build airplanes, whatever it is, they have what we call the dilemma of interpretation. They need to decide what it means. And often in a system where they have to provide for their own defense, no one else is going to do it for them, they're likely to assume the worst. And that's how you get arms races, that's how you get misinterpretation and escalation. That's how you get war that no one wants. Okay, um, we're going to take three questions in a row, starting with David Owen. Uh, David Owen Kings. Then I wanted to ask about um, a deliberately deceptive personation. I mean, suppose I, just as a hypothesis, that next year the leadership in Moscow was to say to its various hacker groups, in future we would like your uh, attacks on the United States to look as if they come from North Korea or China. Enough is now known about the signatures about the exploits to produce really quite a good perception. How good do you think the uh, forensic ability would be to detect that? Because absence of defensive intrusion intelligence wouldn't of itself prove anything. They might have set up some network you hadn't penetrated. Nigel Linkster. Yeah, Nigel Linkster here at uh, Travel by Travel S. Um, reference was made in an earlier question to norms, and of course we have for some while uh, been witnessing uh, various iterations of the UN group of governmental experts coming up with uh, um, a series of norms, both uh, prohibitive and uh, I suppose, uh, I'm not quite sure what to call them, uh, enjoining norms. Perhaps. Um, this, this is being done under the aegis of the uh, UN First Committee, which is really a response to Russian concerns about uh, what they have termed uh, information weapons. Two questions. Firstly, you know, what, what do you think of the utility of this process? And secondly, should it be taking place under the aegis of the First Committee, or did we allow ourselves to get sucker punched by the Russians into doing this? Okay, and lastly, one to the left of us. Steve Hill from the National Security Secretary of the Cabinet Affairs. You spoke about nuclear and cyber. Can you add space into that as a domain? Do you see that as a sort of triangular relationship? Right. <coughs> okay. Three hard-hitting questions here. So let's start with uh, deception, particularly Russian deception. 
Now, we have a little bit of data on this front. So there's two um, pieces of malware, malicious code, that are interesting. Um, one is called Inception. For those of you who have seen the movie, uh, it's fairly complex, <laughs> four levels of human subconsciousness. And this piece of malware is named for the movie because a lot of the forensic indicators that analysts use to determine who wrote it, such as the keyboard settings, the time zone indicators, usernames and so forth, have been faked. So we have Arabic indicators, we have Chinese indicators, we have English indicators, Spanish, Portuguese. We don't have Russian. Uh, so the thinking goes, this was a Russian effort to say, don't put too much indication into um, your language indicators. Or they were not as clever as they thought they were in that misdirection. So that's one piece of malicious code. And that, I think, uh, and other examples that are more detailed and less humorous um, count cast some doubt on the value of pure forensics. And even firms that do pure forensics like Kaspersky have said we don't do attribution because you can't get, get definitive attribution from just forensics. A second um, piece which is, which is interesting is a, attack, a cyber attack on a French TV station that was carried out, it seemed, by what's called the cyber caliphate of ISIS. So the messaging was in Arabic. It, it had jihadist messaging uh, publicly in the attack. And it's reasonably clear upon further examination that this was in fact a Russian operation. And no one knows why they did it. One theory is that they were testing their capacity to develop a false flag and to deploy indeed a false flag operation. So um, I think what I'd say is forensics are very useful. They can get you a lot of the picture, but I would not want to do at the nation state level attribution based solely on forensics. And that again is an argument for these kinds of defensive intrusions, which can indeed be escalatory. Now on the UN question, uh, I don't claim expertise in which part of the UN should be handling this. Um, the UN Committee of Governmental Experts, Group of Governmental Experts, has advocated four principles, which I think are a good start, but don't come anywhere near mitigating the cybersecurity dilemma. The first principle in 2013 was that international law applies to cyberspace. Fairly mundane, important if you're an international lawyer, don't get me wrong, but not going not to solve the problem. The most relevant of the 2015 principles is that states should not attack critical infrastructure in peacetime. But this may be an instance of uh, the operational reality of cybersecurity not translating to the strategic policymakers at the UN. Because as I've tried to show here, what's significant is not an attack in peacetime, not the destruction of a system in peacetime, but an intrusion that sets up an attack in war. And if that linkage between intrusion and attack is so strong, as strong as I believe it to be, then indeed the intrusion in peacetime is threatening, and that's not banned. So uh, I think the UN effort is a good one. Uh, it's a, certainly a good foundation, particularly if it provides a mechanism for states to single to each other and, and communicate with each other. But we're nowhere near mitigating the cybersecurity dilemma through that, that fora alone. And then on space, I think it's a very interesting question, and one we have very little data on, um, the cybersecurity capacity of space-based capabilities. An example I'll give here is, for a fair amount of time, the United States taught its sailors and airmen celestial navigation, navigation by the stars. GPS came along, and they stopped teaching them that, because they had this fancy whiz-bang computer system to do it in recognition of the threat uh, to space-based systems, the academies are now teaching celestial navigation again. And developing this kind of resilience probably is a good thing, um, both in space-based assets, but also across the board. Thanks. Heather. Uh, Heather Williams, Kansas College of A two-part question. The first one, I wanted to kind of draw you out a bit more in this what you said about signaling and some of the issues with cyber signaling and forget some nuclear, or forgive me, some nuclear analogies here. Um, where there's, you know, the great shelling quote, the threat only something to chance. So to what extent should cyber signaling be certain? Should it be clear? Does it need to rely on, you know, the three C's of nuclear deterrence, the capability, credibility, and communication? To what extent did those signaling ideas transfer over to cyber? You, you had said there were some issues with it, so I was just curious about that. And then the second one, um, this is has kind of got to strategic culture. And do you see state-based cyber capabilities as being, you know, 10, 20 years from now, will these be pervasive and equal across all states? 
or will states choose how what cyber capabilities to pursue and how to integrate them into their broader strategies based on strategic culture or other factors. So I mean, for, again, forgive the nuclear analogy, but obviously only a certain number of states chose to pursue nuclear weapons, not just for financial or technological reasons, but also because of bigger strategic issues. So does that apply to some? Hi, thank you. Celeste and Gracie Williams from BASIC. Um, just, uh, I think you, you may forgive me for misunderstanding the whole threat, perhaps. It seems to me, you know, you can use a bullet once, but Stuxnet you can download off bits of the dark web. Um, and, and once it's been used, then a lot of these programs, I think, then become sort of open source and people can find them and use them again. Um, now, talking about space, there's a concept called Kepler syndrome, which most people have heard of. This was exemplified in the film Gravity, where um, bits of satellites break off, hit into other bits of satellites, and slowly more and more bits are created until eventually you can't launch anything from, from Earth because it's such an inhospitable environment. Um, and it strikes me, perhaps, that cyber warfare, warfare is a bit more like uh, it, should, it could be viewed through the lens of Kepler syndrome, insofar as the more attacks you do, the more threats are created, not only to the less developed nations, but also to businesses within your own nation, as these things become more and more open source. I just wanted to comment. Do you want to do one more? <coughs> yeah, if, uh, if anyone has one. Yes. Brian, here is you talked a little bit about attribution and perhaps following the back of the last question a little bit. Is there any sense uh, sort of in the interest of de-escalation or preventing escalation uh, of, of declaring attribution, not by signing, but some other way of a truly defensive injury to understand that everyone went to each other to prevent misinterpretation and so on? All right, let's go in order here. So, um, Heather, I'm not going to take the nuclear bait. So I'll talk about deterrence, but I'm not going to do a nuclear context because you're the expert on that. Uh, in the 1980s, U.S. Uh, developed a capability called the F-117A Nighthawk, uh, stealth fighter, first, first stealth fighter. And they attacked Panama in what's called Operation Just Cause. And they deployed the stealth fighter. And those of you who study Panama probably know that there's not great air defenses there. So you wouldn't need a stealth fighter. And the joke in the Pentagon was they deploy it just cause they could. And <laughs> Pentagon humor aside, the lesson there is that um, they developed this capability and they deployed it in an obvious way to communicate to the Russians that they had it. And in answer to the second question, in cyber it doesn't work like that. When you develop and deploy a capability, you communicate that it's been used. And it often isn't as good because the weaknesses, the exploits that are used can be guarded against, can be patched. Um, this, by the way, is why defensive intrusion is so good. You figure out how the weapon is, is going to work, you can block it. You can figure out how nukes are going to work, and you can't block them. So cyber is different in this way. And this makes um, deterrence harder because you can't show your hand as much um, on particular capabilities. So it, it's hard to communicate specifically to the other side. Um, what it is you're capable of doing, and thus it's hard to have a deterrent. Now, the second part of your question, Heather, was about strategic culture. And <coughs> I don't know if I'd parse the details of strategic culture, but just looking forward, I think it's likely that uh, in the absence of some taboo around cyber, the way we have it with nuclear, more states will have cyber capabilities. And it's fair to assume, I think, that the trend line, the power of those capabilities across the board will increase in the same way the power of them has increased dramatically from the late 90s to today, where we are, we're turning off power grids remotely. And the only point I'd make is, right now the cybersecurity dilemma isn't a no holds barred no -hold crisis because it's just a couple big states, US, China, Russia. But there are risks there. Any IR person will tell you political calculus, political signaling gets more complicated when it becomes multilateral, when it's more complex. So I don't think we'll see you know, quality across the board capability, but I do think we'll see um, greater potency of weapons and greater complexity of the interstate relationships. And that's what makes the cybersecurity dilemma more acute, when it's hard to communicate because there's more actors. So now I'm going to go to your notes. Did I answer the, full, the second question? Yes. OK. Space. Um, oh, yes. So right, that was a very, very good point about um, if too many states are using cyber capabilities, does it sort of 
plot the sky, as it were. I think, um, now that I'm trying to put words in his mouth or express great sympathy one way or the other, this is exactly uh, Edward Stone's concern in leaking this particular slide deck and some similar ones. And indeed, other academics have said um, the cybersecurity dilemma is not between nations. The cybersecurity dilemma is between the nations in one block and ordinary citizens in another. Because as nations go back and forth and do harm to one another and threaten one another, the losers are ordinary people whose internet is um, weighed down, under threat, whatever verbs you want to use, um, by this great global cyber game. So I think uh, we can parse it in more complexity, but I think that there's an enormous risk to the militarization of the internet, um, but there's also enormous incentive for states because of what we mentioned before about the self-help system to gather intelligence to prepare attacks. And how that all shakes out is a little too early to say. And there was a third question? I'm yeah, gonna... which was, can you make it clear that what you're doing oh, right. is offensive? Right? Uh, Ryan, you might study malaria, but this is actually a great point, uh, and one that there's been a lot of work in. Um, can you signal through a cryptographic key, for example, that a particular piece of malicious code is yours? Um, you can, and indeed there's, there's some work um, about potentially the value of that. The problem is that that indeed solves ambiguity around attribution uh, and the provenance of the malicious code. It doesn't solve the ambiguity around intention, which is significant. Um, because remember, in the examples we laid out here, it's not just the, the determining the actor that's important and determining the capability that's important, it's determining their intention. And this is an age old problem in international relations figuring out what another nation is trying to do with its capabilities. So there's a lot of interesting stuff on the, the signing of code, but intentions, I think, are, will always be the uncracked nut in international politics. Yes, please, the lady here. Um, hello, uh, Joyce Hackney from Chatham House. You mentioned the US-China cyber agreement. I was wondering, how do you evaluate, evaluate the effectiveness of this agreement so far? And um, how do you see, or do you see any threat to its application or even existence under the new administration? Thanks. And the gentleman in the blue side Thank you. I'm Fred Hargreaves from the British Army. Um, there's a lot of focus, and obvious focus, on offensive cyber in sort of espionage and sort of militarization. Um, but I think another aspect is subversion. And there's not so much talk about cyber enabled disinformation and influence operations to undermine, for instance, US elections, DNC hacks, to, to undermine the, the sort of Western society and Western polity view on the EU, on NATO, or whatever. Um, I'd be interested in your thoughts on the state use of cyber in the sort of post-truth politics era that we find ourselves in. Um, I, want, I want to add a couple of questions on that topic, so I think it's important. Um, yes, um, one is, um, to differentiate the, the bits of uh, hacking that were apparently influ uh, influential in the US election context. How, uh, how unprecedented is it for, how unprecedented do you think the level of intrusion into the DNC and Podesta was? But then secondly, how unprecedented was the disclosure of the material as a separate thing? And then thirdly, on this point, how worried should the French, the Germans be, the Dutch, that similar things are going to happen, especially given perhaps their relative lack of power to, to, to retaliate? All right, let's go in order here. So on the China point, there was an agreement between the United States and China last September that, as I said, um, forbid hacking for the purposes of economic espionage to benefit particular companies. And um, we have seen since then a decrease in apparent Chinese hacking. I, that sense is very precise. We've seen a decrease in what's apparent. Part of it is the Chinese used to be, broadly speaking, the uh, jewel thieves, smash and grab jewel thieves of hacking. They'd break the window, they'd take the jewels, you knew they were there. The question was, can you catch them and what are you going to do about it? Um, if it's now forbidden, they may be stealthier. So I think there's still a period of trying to sort out where the Chinese are in all of this. Um, and it's a little too soon to say if they've actually tamped back their activity or if they've just gotten better at it. 
or that's focusing on the right targets. Uh, so that's one. And then um, this, this question about uh, subversion, and I think it's a very good one. Um, one of the things I was thinking about as this book was already in press is the, the DNC hacks would not probably qualify under my definition of networks that would be prone to the cybersecurity dilemma. Are they truly of strategic importance? And I would have said if you asked me last year, no. But it is clear that maybe they should be. Uh, maybe we should recognize that the campaign emails are incredibly significant in influencing public debate. So one effect, I think, of the DNC hacks is analysts are looking and saying, well, the, the attack surface here, the areas of vulnerability, are much broader than we thought. Because it's not just can we guard the NSA against the Chinese intrusion. It's can we guard a 60-year-old Democratic operative against a spear phishing email, um, recognizing that if he clicks the wrong link once, um, years of potentially embarrassing emails are going to be dumped. And that's, I think, gets to the third point, which is what's significant here is not the intrusion. Um, because we know the McCain Obama campaigns were spied on, we know the Romney campaign was spied on, we know the United States and presumably its partners spy on foreign political campaigns all the time. Uh, what's significant here is the disclosure of emails, and this is a, a change in tactics that uh, is new, and I think historians will debate for a long time whether or not it's effective. Um, it did not merit a strong United States response. There was no apparent escalation. It's hard to know what happens in the shadows. There's no apparent escalation. Some say, and I don't know if they're wrong about this, that the lack of a response, and indeed the possible effectiveness of the campaign, should make the Germans and the Dutch and the Italians and the French very worried. Um, I've heard anecdotally those companies are reaching out to cybersecurity firms already, saying we feel we're going to be under threat and we need to be ready for this. I think that's the right approach. I, I think that this may be the beginning of a new tactic in which authoritarian states perceive the election systems broadly construed, not just machines, of the West as an opportunity to do subversion. And we don't have a norm against that, and we don't have a capacity to respond because their elections don't work in the same way, to put it mildly. Okay, we have time for another round. I have Michael Adair on my list. Thank you. Um, three or four years ago now, the Department of Justice indicted four or five PL officers with their photographs. You can't get any more precise than that, and that was four years ago. So the forensic seems to have hit it right on the ball. Um, why are we worried about ambiguity or uncertainty of the evidence if you can get to people with photographs? Okay. Yeah, Frank? Just to follow up on what you just said, I mean, the, it's not, you were sort of hinted that maybe it was justified not to have a strong response by the United States to the Russian hack and the release of emails. Um, do, you, do you not think, I mean, this was an interference in an election process? Should there be a stronger response? Should there be something that goes very deep? So, should there be a, a muscular response, or do you think that will be comfortable? Okay. Just to uh, embellish that, I'm imagining a scenario where um, the lame duck administration, because of the new circumstances, decides that it will retaliate in perhaps an ostentatious way, possibly a damaging way, and leave it to the complication of then retaliating against a presumably more friendly country under Trump, uh, where that speculation leads, leading the Russians to retaliate, to escalate. Um, so let me add one more to that list, which is, uh, this may be hard to answer based on what's public, but are there ways in which the Obama administration has been restrained in this area that a Trump administration might not be so restrained? So, you know, if, if a, with a president less inclined to restraint of, of the use of American uh, power, what might we be likely to see? And if you have anything else to say that you haven't already said, and now the time to announce it. About Trump or just in general? In general. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so let's do the first one. So yeah, I think you're right. Four years ago, the Department of Justice indicted five PLA officers 
in 2014, 15, they indicted seven Iranians. Um, I think this is proof that, you know, when you deploy a full capacity of a nation's intelligence gathering capabilities, uh, particularly against less sophisticated threats like low-level Chinese operators and Iranian operators, attribution is possible. So um, I don't have a doubt that in a really important circumstance, provided you have intelligence coming from sources beyond the forensics, um, attribution can be done. Now, uh, I think all the election ones sort of come together. Um, my best guess, and it's just a guess, is the Obama administration did not want to politicize the issue by retaliating prior to the election. And I think they thought, like the rest of us, that um, Hillary Clinton would be the next president, and you'd have a transfer of power, and they might be able to retaliate in lame duck. Uh, I don't know how that calculus change, changes with um, the fact that Obama's leaving office. Does he retaliate, as you suggested, in December and leave it to Trump to clean up the mess? Um, couldn't, couldn't begin to tell you. Um, I do agree, uh, I think, with the broader principle that um, the West should articulate very clearly that elections um, are a fundamental part of our system of governance, and they're not to be trifled with. So um, I suspect that President Obama agrees with me on that, uh, despite recent results. And um, maybe they're finding a way to communicate that in secret, or maybe uh, they intended to communicate it after the election when it wasn't political. And now they're in this limbo they need to sort out. So uh, I think um, he is more inclined towards caution, which on balance is not a bad thing, uh, than other presidents, including the incoming president. Uh, I have no idea how Donald Trump's going to handle cyber. I wouldn't want to guess. Um, it's going to be the best cyber. It's going to be the best. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I know he doesn't use computer, uh, and he doesn't use email, unlike his opponent. And um, so I think there's a lot, a lot to be to, to sort through. Um, too early to say how it shakes out. I think in general, the opportunity must be taken at some point, and perhaps it's gone to indicate that elections are important, and this is an area in which we are willing to to defend uh, and risk escalation. Great. Well, Ben, this has been a really wide-ranging discussion, for which I thank you very much. Thank um, you for I having me. I encourage you to buy his book next year when it comes out, The Cybersecurity Dilemma. I also encourage you to go back and read Ben's survival articles, which are available on the um, IISS website and also our publishers, Taylor and Francis. And it only remains for me to say, um, please join me in thanking Ben. Thank you.